Assalamu alaikum. So welcome to Biochemistry 2 for dental students. Um, now in this course, the, the course focuses on metabolism, but um, I'll start with you uh, with six lectures. Um, we will cover a few techniques related to molecular biology. Okay, so um, and then I'll stop. That that's that's my role. Now, in the first three lectures, I'll focus on recombinant DNA-based molecular techniques. And in the next three lectures, I'll talk about enzyme-based molecular techniques. Of course, there are things that overlap. There are techniques that overlap uh, between these um, uh, six lectures. So let's start with uh, DNA cloning. What is DNA cloning? So DNA cloning is basically trying to amplify a DNA segment. So basically you start with uh, one molecule or one DNA molecule and you make many, many copies of this molecule. And usually uh, this is done in a biological system. Again, usually it is bacterial cells that we utilize to, um, to, to make many copies of these DNA segments. So usually when we do DNA cloning, they, this involves the formation of a recombinant DNA. So what is a recombinant DNA? Recombinant DNA is basically a DNA molecule that is made of two or more uh, uh, fragments of DNA taken from different sources, okay? And this recombinant DNA is composed of basically a vector, which is a carrier, okay? And usually this carrier is a bacterial plasmid. We'll talk about bacterial plasmids. And then um, the, the, we insert the uh, DNA, which is usually also protein coding, a protein coding gene. And in order to form uh, this recombinant DNA, we utilize restriction in the nucleases. So we insert this recombinant DNA in bacteria and we let bacteria make um, many copies of this recombinant DNA. So restriction in the nucleases are basically uh, enzymes that cleave DNA. Okay, so a nuclease is an enzyme that cleaves nucleic acids. Indo means that the cut occurs within the DNA itself, not from either end, not from the five prime end or the three prime end. Okay, restriction means that they restrict the growth of uh, bacteriophages, that is bacterial uh, viruses. So to simplify it, you know, I, I um, sort of modify the definition of restriction by saying that they are restricted by where they cleave because they cleave within certain sequences. Okay. So, for example, this enzyme right here recognizes this, recognizes this sequence, CCCGGG. Okay. Now, notice that on the other side, of on the, on the other fragment, notice that it also reads the same exact thing from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end, CCCGGG. Okay. So, the enzyme cleaves within this sequence right here. Okay. But, so, it cleaves the phosphodiester bond that connects these two nucleotides to each other. Okay, so, uh, and these sites are known as restriction sites and they generate uh, restriction fragments. So these are restriction fragments. So these are restriction endonucleases. Now notice that, notice that the sequence that is um, uh, recognized and, and uh, the cleavage occurs within, within the sequence is read, as I said, from either side, from either fragment, from either strand, uh, the same exact thing. So echo R1, this enzyme right here, recognizes the sequence G-A-A-T-T-C. You know, from the other side, G-A-A-T-T-C. Hindi 3 also recognizes a sequence that is read the exact same thing from either uh, strand. A A G C T T A A G C T T. Oh, remember we, we start reading from the five prime end to that three prime end, and so on. Now such sequences are known as palindromic sequences. 
okay so that is a sequence that is read uh, the same exact thing uh, from either strand 5 prime to 3 prime okay now it just happens as well that these restriction endonucleases do not cut exactly in the middle so echo r1 which recognizes the sequence GAATTC does not really cleave right in the middle. Rather, it cleaves between, between G and A on this side, and of course, G and A from the other side, because it doesn't matter, okay? It, 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 the enzyme doesn't uh, see this strand as top and the other one as bottom, okay? So it's the same thing. So the cleavage occurs right here between G and A, and same thing here, G and A. And that uh, generates fragments with um, overhangs. We call these overhangs, meaning that they are uh, not bound by not, not hydrogen bonded to uh, to the other uh, strand. Okay, so you get something like this. Now, and and these are known as cohesive ends this end here and this end right here are known as cohesive ends because they are cohesive they can hydrogen bond together again because they are complementary to each other so the the T from this strand would hydrogen bond with the A on the other strand okay uh, right here so the A on, on this strand now so these are known as cohesive ends. Now this is different than other enzymes, restriction of the nucleases that also cut DNA right in the middle, in the center of the restriction uh, site, uh, and 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 that generates blunt-ended fragments. Notice that they are not cohesive. Okay, they cannot hydrogen bond to each other anymore. So we are mainly uh, concerned with enzymes that that uh, generate um, fragments with cohesive ends because these are really useful for DNA cloning. Okay, so the idea here is that if we take two uh, DNA fragments from two different sources and we add echo R1 to both of them you will have the generation of uh, restriction fragments having complementary ends. So this is, uh, let's say, bacterial DNA, and this is human DNA. We make these cuts with echo R1, and you will have the, the generation of restriction fragments with cohesive ends. Now, if we mix the bacterial DNA with the human DNA, it doesn't, you know, DNA doesn't say, oh, you're human, oh, no, you're bacterial, I'm not going to hydrogen bond with you. It doesn't matter, okay? They're equal. So, basically, the human DNA will, would form hydrogen bonds with the bacterial DNA, okay? And these can be one. So, that's recombinant DNA, a DNA that, that comes from two different sources, bacterial, human in this case. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are not really that stable. We need to form covalent linkages between the, the two fragments. We need to form phosphodiester bonds between the two fragments. So once they hydrogen bond to each other, you can add DNA ligase and DNA ligase utilizes ATP to form a phosphodiester bond between the two ends of the DNA fragments. Now you have one uh, the, a continuous DNA fragment. Okay, that is very stable. Now, so what is cloning? Now the word cloning means that you that you make several copies of one thing. So you can say bacterial clone, and what that means is that you can have single bacterial cells grown in a petri dish and if you come next day you will have the formation of colony okay now all of these cells are clones of this one right here and all of these cells right here are all clones of this bacterial cell right there and so on okay 
So that 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 what cloning means. Now, if I say um, human cloning, it means you're making an exact same copy of a human being, same DNA, same looks, same maybe personality. You never know. Okay, so that what cloning means. So how do we make um, uh, how do we make how do we clone DNA? So basically, what we do is we take bacterial plasmid. Now these molecules are uh, they come from bacteria cells. They are circular. They are different than bacterial chromosomes. Okay, and we use them to insert the DNA of interest inside them. So what we do is that we digest both of the of both of these DNA fragments with the same restriction enzyme generating cohesive ends now these cohesive cohesive ends right here are complementary to each other so eventually you will have the integration of this dna fragment into the plasmid you add a dna ligase and now it's covalently attached to it so it becomes part of it now this is recombinant dna okay now so why do we use plasmids? Because they are uh, different than bacterial DNA, than the bacterial chromosome. They can replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. So inside bacterial cells, you can have multiple plasmids and these plasmids are copies of each other, or in other words, clones of each other. So, uh, and, uh, so if you have one bacterial cell, you can have 10 plasmids inside it. Okay. So that's a lot of plasmid inside a bacterial cell. Okay. Now, what type of plasmids uh, can we use? Well, the thing is, um, the the plasmid first it must replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome, so it has to have its own origin of replication. Remember that we talked about it in the uh, molecular biology uh, lectures so uh, it has to have its own or origin of replication so it can replicate independently of bacterial chromosome that's one two there must be a place by which we can insert the DNA fragment inside it okay so it can be um, a place that can be cleaved once only once by a restriction in the nucleus so it opens up we can add our DNA fragment of interest and it can it would form hydrogen bonds with it and then DNA ligase would close the large circle okay so in in this region right here you can have multiple restriction sites each one is recognized by a specific restriction in the nuclease and we choose the restriction in the nucleus that can cleave the plasmid just once and the same enzyme would also cleave the dna fragment okay also once now the third um, feature or the third component of a plasmid or a vector is that it has to have a, what we call a selection marker or a selectable marker or a selective marker so basically that is in other words we have to um, use a plasmid that once it gets into bacterial cell we can select this bacterial cell if a bacterial cell does not contain the plasmid we don't want this bacterial cell it's useless so we use a so we use a selectable marker so which is basically an antibiotic resistance gene okay so bacterial cells that contain the plasmid and this plasmid contains uh, an antibiotic resistance gene if we add an antibiotic to this bacterial cell the bacterial cell would survive that if this bacterial cell does not contain the plasmid then the then the bacterial cell would die if we add this antibiotic so this is what we mean by selectable marker okay so it's a marker that allows us to select bacteria that contain the plasmid 
and all bacterial cells that could, do not contain the plasma would be eliminated. They would die. So here's the idea. That's how we make it. Again, we take a DNA fragment of interest from, let's say, human genome. Okay, we cut it with a restriction endonuclease like ECHOR1. We generate a DNA fragment with cohesive ends, which are also known as sticky ends because they stick to each other. And then we take a plasmid from bacterial cell. We use the same exact restriction endonuclease. It opens up, right? When we mix the DNA fragment of interest with the plasmid, uh, they would form hydrogen bonds to each other. We add a DNA ligase. Now they become just one large uh, recombinant DNA. We insert this inside bacteria, and the bacteria would make many copies of this plasmid with the insert inside it. Again, if we add an antibiotic like ampicillin, for example, okay, now the bacterial cell that contains uh, the plasmid would survive, but the cell that does not contain the plasmid would die as a result of ampicillin, so they cannot replicate any more. If we allow this, the, these bacteria to grow, now each one of them would make multiple copies of the plasmid. So let's say that you start with one bacterial cell, you come next day, and, and you will have millions of bacterial cells. And if we say that each one of them contains uh, three plasmids, let's say, and you have 10 million bacterial cells, now you have 30 million plasmids, okay, overnight. So, so you have the DNA amplified. What we do next is that we can isolate the plasmid from these bacterial cells, and if we add the restriction in the nuclease that we use to make the recombinant DNA, so if we use ECHOR1, for example, the DNA insert would be uh, separated from the plasmid. Now, we have many, many copies that are made by these bacterial cells. And this is DNA cloning. So, we can use DNA cloning to make copies of a DNA fragment of interest. Now, usually this DNA fragment is actually a gene. That is, it's a piece of uh, um, a, a region on DNA that can be transcribed. So you have the formation of a messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA can be used for translation, generating a protein. So we can, in other words, we can utilize bacterial cells to synthesize human genes or, or human proteins by inserting a plasmid that contains a human gene inside them. Now remember, in, in transcription, you need a promoter, right? So the RNA polymerase would bind to the promoter and it would start transcription, generating a messenger RNA. Now, the other thing in bacteria is that bacterial cells need Schein-Delgarno sequence. So what's a Schein-Delgarno sequence? It is the ribosomal binding site. So the ribosomes would bind here at the Schindel-Garno sequence, and they would start at the first AUG, right? That comes right after this Schindel-Garno sequence. So you will have translation going on, okay? And you have to have, of course, a translation stop codon, UAG, UGA, UGG, UAA, sorry. Okay, so, and you will have a polypeptide formed inside bacterial cells, human protein. So again, we need a special plasmid, and we call this plasmid an expression vector. Why do we call it this? Because we use it to express genes. Now this expression vector, it should have a promoter right here. It should have a shine delgarno sequence right there and a cloning site. And of course, it should have also a stop, uh, stop codon or a transcription start site and a, uh, a stop codon as well. Now, what happens again is that we open up the plasmid with the restriction in the nucleus, 
we also form uh, a DNA fragment or we have DNA fragment uh, representing a gene and we use the same uh, restriction in the nuclease and we insert the DNA fragment or the gene so that into the plasma so it becomes part of the plasmid. Now, if we insert this plasmid in some bacterial cells, again, the RNA polymerase would bind to the promoter, generating messenger RNA. Ribosomes would bind to the Schindel-Garner sequence, and you will have the formation of a polypeptide. Okay, and this polypeptide can fold inside bacterial cells. Okay, so right here, uh, here we have uh, just the vector. Uh, or bacterial cells without a vector. So these are all the proteins extracted or released from uh, the bacterial cells. Okay. Now here we have bacteria that contain the vector. Okay. Again, you will have all of the proteins inside these bacterial cells. And notice this band right here. Okay. This band represents the expressed gene. The protein that uh, that is synthesized from the vector, the expression vector. Now, what do we call this technique where we separate proteins through a gel? Remember, it's called a Western blot. Okay, so that's a Western blot. Remember that. So please go back to your biochemistry one course and try to remember what a Western blot is. Okay, or SDS page, in other words. Okay, so that's SDS page. Now, um, what else? But we have a problem when it when it comes to um, to uh, to letting bacteria synthesize human proteins, and that is human genes contain introns, right? And these introns are non-coding. And usually, when you have the synthesis of RNA, this is pre-messenger RNA. It contains the introns, and these introns are removed via splicing, right? Now you have the mature messenger RNA that can be used for translation, for protein synthesis. So bacteria do not have splicing. So how can we solve this problem? Well, the solution here is to use reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase is a viral enzyme. What it does is that it converts RNA into DNA. So we take the messenger RNA, okay, we add reverse transcriptase, and you have the synthesis of an RNA molecule. Now, uh, sorry, the synthesis of a DNA molecule, and this DNA molecule does not have um, introns. Now we add DNA polymerase, it synthesizes the second strand. Now you have double-stranded DNA that looks exactly like the gene, except that it does not contain any introns, just exons. Now if we insert the cDNA, complementary DNA, into bacterial cells, inside a, an expression vector, you can have the synthesis of a messenger RNA from this DNA, okay? Uh, except that it doesn't require splicing. And this messenger RNA can be used for translation um, inside bacteria. But we have other problems when it comes to synthesizing human proteins inside bacteria. Now, one problem is that bacterial proteins do not contain disulfide bonds. So if you have a protein that needs uh, to, to, um, to be stabilized or to have the proper structure uh, via disulfide bonds, well, this doesn't happen in bacteria. The other thing is that um, there is no post-translation modification, like, for example, glycosylation. Bacterial proteins cannot be glycosylated like human proteins. Um, some proteins require special uh, assistance, right? Remember when we talked about uh, um, chaperones and we said that these proteins help uh, folding uh, yeah, complex proteins, human proteins. Also, sometimes bacteria do not like the protein 
that it has just synthesized so it degrades it so we have these problems uh, happening in, in, in during synthesis of human proteins inside bacterial cells so how do you solve this problem well we can use yeast now yeast actually they are eukaryotic systems and they are single cells that's how they look like and um, they share properties of bacteria and human cells so it's eukaryotic you can have disulfide bonds inside yeast inside yeast proteins you can have a special folding post translation modification okay but at the same time yeast cells grow really fast just like bacteria and they look like bacteria overall so we can use yeast to synthesize human proteins okay great so now we have the synthesis of a human protein inside bacteria via DNA cloning. Let's say that we want to study this protein further. Let's say that we want to purify this protein. How can we do this? Well, we can do a purification of or, or detection of human proteins by doing protein tagging. So what is protein tagging? Basically, the idea of, of tagging, what, what a tag is, it's the label. So if you have a, a, a t-shirt, for example, uh, there's a label, right? And this label is the tag. So what we do is that we tag proteins. We add something to proteins to label it. How do we do this? Well, we use special vectors as well. So what we do here is that we use same thing, same thing plasmids. We open up the plasmid and we insert the gene inside it. So it becomes part of it, except that when this protein is synthesized or when the gene is transcribed, there is this little tag that is uh, synthesized as part of the gene or the messenger RNA. So right here you have uh, the, the messenger RNA having this little piece and this piece is the tag and we use this tag for purification or detection purposes okay so that's recombinant protein again okay. now the idea here is that by doing SDS page, we have the protein of interest, let's say, and this protein is tagged. We can do immunoblotting or Western blots, whereby we add antibodies that recognize the tag, not necessarily the protein itself. Rather, it recognizes the tag. So we can see the protein that is tagged, okay, if it is uh, present in, uh, in our samples or not. Again, go back to the biochemistry lectures and uh, try to remember what Western blots are exactly. We can also use it for uh, purification. So let's say that we have, we do affinity chromatography. So we have a bead and on the surface of the beads, we have these antibodies and these antibodies recognize that tag. Again, not the protein, just the tag. So if we have uh, if we pass proteins through a the column of affinity chromatography, that tag, which is right here, would bind to the antibodies. Okay, so we have the pu pu protein itself purified using affinity chromatography. Now we use these uh, techniques to help us detect proteins or to purify proteins. Sometimes we do not really have antibodies against the protein. And sometimes these antibodies are not really efficient in detecting or purifying the protein. So we use tags to allow us to detect or uh, purify these proteins. Now, there are different tags that can be used. You can, uh, one of the most famous tags is the polyhis tag, which is basically six histidines that become part of the protein and these do not really disrupt protein folding okay uh, we can use um, something like flag a different sequence um, 
uh, we can use a whole protein as well. So we can have something like green fluorescent protein. I'll show you uh, examples of that. Or we can use a, an enzyme like glutathione S transferase. Okay, so it, it can be something really complex, not as simple as a, a His tag. Now, this is the his tag, basically. Um, the, the beauty of the his tag is that we can use um, a, a nickel column, affinity chromatography column. On the beads, we have a nickel. And this nickel would bind to the six histidines. Okay, it's very specific. So if we, if we have the, our protein with six histidine residues, well, and we pass all proteins through a column. Well, how many proteins have six histidines? You know, one after the other? None. Zero. So it's only this protein, our protein, that would bind to the nickel and it can be purified. So notice here we have two samples um, having th that's, that's a, an SDS page and proteins are labeled. A lot of proteins in our samples here. But after purifying uh, the protein via an affinity chromatography having a nickel on the bead, we only have a single protein, single band. This is our protein. That's beautiful purification of protein. Now we can use a whole uh, enzyme. So this is our protein of interest right here, and we connect to it, we link to it glutathione S transferase. Same thing, we have affinity chromatography. And we have glutathione. Glutathione is the substrate of this enzyme. So if we pass this protein, recombinant protein, through a column, affinity chromatography column, having uh, glutathione uh, attached on beads, the enzyme would bind to the glutathione very specifically. Okay, And then we can simply elute. Remember what elute means? It means releasing the bound protein or the protein that is bound in a column. We can elute the protein using glutathione. So if we pass glutathione through the column, the uh, enzyme would bind to the free glutathione and it can be released. Okay. Remember how we talked about conconavulin A and the use of glucose? to uh, purify this, this protein, the Con-A protein. Okay, well, the, the thing about um, uh, proteins is that we can produce recombinant proteins, meaning, meaning uh, a protein that has something uh, conjugated to it or linked to it. So it's, it's made of, of two different sources. So basically, just like we did right, right here with the glutathione S transferase being linked to our protein of interest, well, we can do that by genetic engineering. So we can have gene A that produces protein A, gene B that produces protein B together as one gene. So when this gene is transcribed and then the mRNA is translated, you will have the production of a protein that contains well, actually, both of these proteins link to each other. So the gene would be transcribed as a whole, starting from here all the way to the end. And this whole messenger RNA would be used for translation, producing this recombinant protein that is made of two proteins linked to each other. Beautiful, huh? Well, we can also utilize the, uh, the, the domains Remember what a domain is? Domain is basically a three-dimensional structure of a protein that falls independently of the rest of the protein. So if you have gene A, for example, um, producing a protein A, and this protein A is composed of two domains. Well, this domain falls independently of the other domain. Let's say that we have gene B. and it also has two domains right here. Okay, and then this domain, the red domain, would fold independently of, of the yellow domain. Well, what if we have, what if we form or create a recombinant gene having a, this domain from gene A and this domain from gene B, and we put them together? 
Well, what happens is that we will have this protein right here that has this domain, the blue domain from gene A and the yellow domain from gene B. So we can do a lot of things, by the way, using genetic engineering, um, taking advantage of domains. And this is actually what we have done, what scientists have done with green fluorescent protein. Now this protein is, um, is produced in jellyfish. Now these jellyfish um, fluoresce, right? Uh, if, if you've seen um, the sea world and, and, and all of the wonders in, in, in deep in the oceans, you can see these um, uh, living um, beings that fluoresce, they produce light. And scientists were able to isolate the gene that is responsible for producing the protein that fluoresces. And the first protein that they were able to isolate um, would fluoresce into something, uh, into a green color, and they called it the green fluorescent protein. And what they did is that they produced, they made a recombinant protein. So you have this protein of interest that is linked to the green fluorescent protein. Now this protein here would fluoresce, would, would produce a green fluorescence. So wherever this protein goes, we can see how it moves inside cells because wherever it goes, it fluoresces. So under the microscope, we can see where it goes. We can see where it is produced as well. Okay, so um, this, is, this is done using, using recombinant DNA technology. Now, um, just a few uh, images. Um, to mesmerize with these images, so beautiful images of, of different uh, proteins linked with green fluorescent protein. So here we have a whole cell that fluoresces. The, the, protein, the green fluorescent protein is produced by itself and it goes all over the cell, okay? So the whole cell fluoresces. Um, here we have the actin protein. So you can see the actin filaments inside cells. Okay, so it's only the actin that is uh, that that generates this fluorescence. Here we have the tubulin protein, so you can see how the microtubules are organized inside cells. Here, here we have mitochondria that fluoresce. So we have a mitochondrial protein that is conjugated to green fluorescent protein. So the whole mitochondria uh, fluoresce. Here we have whole organisms whether plants, worms, flies, rabbits, you name it, okay? You can see how the whole organism fluoresces. Same thing here, different cells fluoresce. Here we have uh, neurons that fluoresce and you can see how they are connected to each other. And this is the beauty of biochemistry and molecular biology.